can only be attributable to human error. Where are we going next? It's a phantom from another town. No one, Mr. Mulder. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. Hello, I'm Alex Daikaiju. I'm Jasmine May with. And I'm Eli Watson. And you're listening to. Cryptid. All together now. Cryptid Campfire. There we go, boys. There we go. Shake that rust off a little <laughs> bit. Shake it off. Welcome back. Welcome back. Easter just passed, right? Hopefully, by the time this episode comes out, that's still time relevant because it's relevant right now when we're recording. But how was you guys this Easter? Did you do anything special, fun at all, maybe? Uh, I had a great Easter. I uh, was able to wake up early. I worked later that day, so we got up. We made baskets for each other, me and my wife. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, we got to get each other some, some presents. She got me little baby dinosaurs. We got each other candy. And she put she did an Easter egg hunt for me, too. <laughs> that's adorable. I love that. We didn't do anything for Easter. <laughs> We watched Planet Rise of the Planet of the Apes on Easter. And I wanted to watch Jesus shows. We watched a Jesus show the next day. Yeah, but that was an Easter. That's okay. Jesus was already dead and came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about Jesus a little later, but the question I have to raise for all of us here at the table is, is the Easter bunny a cryptid? Is the Joker a cryptid? <laughs> I wasn't there for that conversation, so I don't know where you guys settled on that. I haven't listened to that conversation since it happened. I don't remember what happened. (laughs) (laughs) They're wild times. Wild times. But no, for real. Yes, this is kind of a, a little bit of a joke question, because I don't think we categorize the mythical holiday creatures in the same way we categorize cryptids. But, you know, my brother, when he, when we were kids... He claimed to have actually seen the Easter Bunny. And I texted him about it this Easter because I was like, hey, I think we're going to be talking about the Easter Bunny on our next episode. And I know that you said you thought you saw it at one point. Can you just recount that story for me so I can read it on air? And he said, of course. And he says that looking back on it, it was definitely just a dream or at the very least a half-sleep hallucination of something. That's how they get us to discredit ourselves. Yeah, they get us to disbelieve ourselves. Yeah, who's paying your brother off? I don't know. Follow the money trail. I don't have to ask him. But this is what he says he saw. So he was in the middle of the night. So he got up in the middle of the night, presumably to like use the restroom or get some water or something. And the way that his room was set up was you could crawl to the foot of his bed. Remember, he's a child, so he's little in this bed. Crawl to the foot of the bed and open the door and see into our kitchen. That's the way that our house is set up. And so he did that. He was getting out of bed and he crawled to the end of the bed and he opened the door and he saw into the kitchen. Everything was dark and like normal because it's nighttime. Except for the fact that the fridge door was open. And he claims that he saw two giant orange bunny ears poking out of the fridge as if the Easter bunny was bent down rummaging through the fridge. It was just a quick glimpse, though, because he was concerned that this was going to sort of be like a Santa Claus situation where if, you know, he catches you catching him, then, you know, you don't get the gifts or whatever. You get banned on the naughty list. (laughs) You get you get put on the Easter naughty list. So he just closed the door and went back to sleep. But for a long while, he claimed, yeah, dude, I saw the Easter bunny. And I mean, you could make the argument now that he did, and he's just lying to himself. But I don't know. I just thought that was kind of a fun little story. So the Easter bunny was bent down, but you could see the ears above the fridge. Well, yeah, I mean, think about it. When you get in a fridge, you bend down a little bit, but the Easter bunny's ears stick up so high So even though a normal person bending down in the fridge would be completely blocked by the door, his long ears are still going to stick up over top. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, What I think is interesting is the color. Orange. Easter Bunny's orange, according to my brother. And on that note... uh... (laughs) Well, I guess I'm just more curious. How do you feel about this, Jasmine? Because it was your house, too, at the time. And so the 
the cultural norms that we've been raised with the Easter Bunny is he breaks into our house but leaves eggs. But apparently that night he broke into your guys' house and was stealing from the fridge. Stealing um, eggs to give to the neighbors. Oh, it's if just you... this pyramid scheme of stealing <laughs> eggs from each other. I, I wasn't going to talk about this because this isn't the, the main subject oh. of today's podcast. But since Alex asked without any prompting, oh, I will just admit... I was a hardcore Easter Bunny believer to the point where I would pray to the Easter Bunny. Wow. <laughs> because I was so discouraged by people telling me that he wasn't real, and I was so mad at all of my friends for saying he wasn't real. I would literally like be in my bed crying, saying, I know you're real. And I tasked the Easter Bunny with proving me right. Like I didn't tell my parents about this. I didn't tell anybody about this it was a quiet prayer that i said to the easter bunny i was like if you're real you will hide an easter egg with a slap bracelet in it in these specific spots and i don't remember the specific spots i asked for but i i prayed that the easter bunny would hide slap bracelets in plastic easter eggs at specific points in a house and i would know he was real did it work no oh. <laughs> because i kept that to myself i'm sure had i told my parents i prayed to the easter bunny and asked him for this i would have gotten those things in those spots but yeah interesting yeah it's oh. very interesting i'm wondering you know because the maybe the easter bunny is is it white typically typically yeah but like i said according is to my it, brother is it it's like orange. like flamingos mm. you know they eat shrimp and they turn pink yeah, because they're born white. Right, exactly. So maybe the Easter Bunny eats a bunch of Cheetos. No, you're <laughs> missing. Orange. You're missing the obvious connection here. What else is orange that rabbits regularly are pictured eating? Your Halloween costume, a carrot. <laughs> yes, carrots. Rabbits eat carrots. Of course, uh, the Easter Bunny's orange. Well, it's funny too because Eli thinks people keep Cheetos in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. You gotta keep them crisp. <laughs> well, the question of whether the Easter Bunny is a cryptid or not is not as... Well, I was gonna say not as interesting, but it's just as interesting as to where the Easter Bunny tradition actually came from. Because when you think about Easter, you've got sort of the two sides of it. The Easter Bunny with the eggs and the peeps and the chicks and the blotty and the chocolate. I said blotty, and I hope that came across as me being like blotty, blotty, blah. But then I said another word at the end of it. So it I thought it was like what's blotty. I was like, is this some kind of strange Ohio candy? No. Yeah, no, no, no. Ohio candy. I just kept going, and then you've got the other side of it with the Christian celebration of Jesus's resurrection and whatnot. So it's kind of like, well, where do those two things come? Yeah, how, yeah. How did that? How did this become the the joint holiday we know it as, buddy? There's a lot of Easter traditions, like the Easter Bunny itself, that stem from pagan roots, and then were incorporated into the celebration. Is of that Easter. true, though? That's listen. Let me finish my sentence because maybe not. <laughs> but um, these things were incorporated into the Christian tradition of honoring the day Jesus rose from the dead, and there's a lot going on here. Because when I looked into this it was like every source i went to had something different to say and that's not necessarily because any of them were wrong but simply because there is just so much getting rolled together even the use of the words hair and rabbit slash bunny are used interchangeably despite them being two different species so yeah let's talk about that i have learned that hares and rabbits are different mm -hmm. i did not know that and then I was like, well, maybe I've never seen a hare. But another name for a hare is jackrabbit. Mm. So I have seen hares. Mm -hmm. We have hares. I have hares on my head. Oh. oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the TED Talk. <laughs> no, but yeah. No, but yeah. No, but yeah. No, but yeah. Hares what? are generally bigger than rabbits slash bunnies. So rabbits are smaller and they have shorter ears than hares. But. Yeah, hairs are big. I had remember no when we took a walk and I saw one up in the middle of the road, and Don't. Jasmine was like, "Is that a coyote?" <laughs> so. I wasn't wearing my glasses, and you know this. <laughs> um, but anyways, so this episode that we're doing today, 
we're actually going to end up talking about two German rabbits. The first one being the Easter Bunny and the second one being the Wolpertinger. But I kind of dug myself into a hole and didn't realize what we were getting into when I started researching the Easter Bunny because there is so much that goes into it. But with that being said, I think today our goal is to just kind of give you a brief little preview of the theories of where the Easter Bunny tradition comes from because nobody really knows for sure. Okay, we're going to start with what we know. Mm-hmm. Here's what we know. The Easter hair. You know what I didn't look up? Hmm. What does the word Easter even mean? Well, I... Are you asking genuinely? Yeah, I, I, okay. that's why I said I didn't look it Great. up. Okay, well, the, <laughs> the word Easter is sometimes said to have been derived from Joster, who's a Germanic goddess of spring and fertility. So, Bede, who was an early medieval monk considered to be the father of English history, noted that in 8th century England, the month of April was called Joster month, after the goddess, and so there were spring festivals that paid tribute to the renewal of the earth and the rebirth of life after the dead of winter. And recent archaeological research appears to confirm that the worship of Eoster in parts of England and Germany took place, and there were feasts held in her honor on the vernal equinox, and the hare was apparently her like main symbol, like her companion, her mascot. Sort it was of. her deity. Mm-hmm. I also read that that wasn't true. Exactly. Oh, which really? is why, yeah. which is why I'm telling you, I'm giving the disclaimer that there are a lot of disagreements about this because not everybody believes in these connections, nor that worship was ever actually paid to Oster. But I think there was an article I read that summed it up pretty great, where they basically were like, it "Doesn't really matter because regardless, hares and rabbits and even eggs." have been symbols of springtime and fertility for thousands of years in various cultures and religions and everything like that. So whether or not Yoster existed or was worshipped or anything like that doesn't really make a difference when it comes to the symbolism of springtime and Easter and new life and stuff like that. We're going to break it down. Yeah, because the eggs and the bunnies Mm -hmm. and Easter being derived from... Easter or Easter, because then they say Jesus rose on Easter Sunday. So is this like a different kind of Easter? I'm. We're gonna. Oh, we're getting to this. Don't okay. Worry. Don't okay. Worry. Here we go. Cool. So cool. back to what we know. Mm-hmm. There is a tradition of the Easter hare mm-hmm. or the Osterhaus, mm-hmm. and it or was the Osterhaus. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, now okay. <laughs> and it was a hare that. Well, I have two kind of different tales about this. But basically, it was a hare that laid colorful eggs or carried colorful eggs in a sort of basket with also candy, sometimes toys. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a Santa Claus situation where it decided who was naughty, who was nice. And it gave these things to the nice children. And, uh... And this also comes from Germany, correct? This comes from Germany. And so it said, it lays colorful eggs, and that got me thinking, you know, green eggs and ham. Oh, Lord. We know where the green eggs come from now. Uh-huh. Anyways, that's my connect. I'm drawing, it's like a conspiracy board yes. with the red. What, where's the green ham come from? The Frankenstein pigs. Squ- <laughs> squonk? I don't know. <laughs> squonk? <laughs> Shrek, uh, maybe? So, this is also called Easter Tide, like Yule Tide, but Easter instead. Everyone following? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So, there is the earliest known mention of the Easter Bunny comes from a German text called A Dictionary of English Folklore, which I find funny because it's a German text talking about English folklore from 1572 and it says do not worry if the Easter Bunny escapes you should we miss his eggs we will cook the nest oh, <laughs> violent. I know that's like the um, that's like the tagline for the Easter Bunny horror movie <laughs> you know like yeah. don't worry if he escapes you if you can't get the eggs we'll just burn the nest <laughs> 
So now the symbolism of things is where what I want to touch on here. Mm-hmm. Because here's a news flash for everybody. The Easter Bunny is not in the Bible. <gasps> yeah, I was kind of wondering. <sighs> that, <laughs> the Easter Bunny, the unicorns, and the dinosaurs got left off Noah's Ark. Yeah, but the Easter Bunny still survived. <laughs> he, he made a raft from the dead. So, as Jasmine mentioned, rabbits and hares have been symbols of spring. But why? Because they were thought to be... For a very long time, which is another interesting fact, they were thought to be hermaphrodites and thought to be able to self-reproduce, like cells individually dividing, which puts a whole new meaning on the they're breeding like rabbits, you know, (laughs) that saying? Yeah. What does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) They're (laughs) self-replicating. Anyways, uh... So, that makes sense, the regeneration thing. Mm -hmm. Spring is obviously thought to be a regenerative uh, time, which makes sense. Also, interestingly enough, this has nothing to do with the Easter Bunny, but something I would like to share is that the constellation of Orion is actually thought to be, uh, how do I say, basically, the constellation of Orion is not visible in the Northern Hemisphere For the majority of the year. I think it's only November through February that you can actually see it. Mm. And so from that point, it changes position in the sky to where it's above us in the northern hemisphere during the day. So like right now, but when the sun's out and you can't see it. Mm. So from the perspective of watching it throughout the season, throughout the winter, is that the Orion's belt disappears into the earth. And so, for a lot of folklore, those three stars make a phallic symbol. Mm. It's impregnating the earth, and then it's filling it full of life. It's Even back in the day, you couldn't get past the good penis joke. I mean, basically. And so, that's why I think the egg makes a lot of sense, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's where that comes from. And then, there's further connections. The connections start to compound. Okay, (laughs) the rabbits and the hares, because they're self-replicating, means they do not have to have intercourse. And so there is depictions of the Mother Mary, a.k.a. the Madonna, holding a rabbit. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, because they share something of the same, that they bore or bear children without intercourse. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Michael alone. But it gets it gets deeper. Now we introduce Lent. Lent comes into the situation, right? It's like, why do we have all these eggs associated with Easter and whatnot? Well, Lent is a 40-day commemoration of abstaining from eating animal products. And it's it's commemorating the time when Jesus went out into the desert and was tempted by the devil for 40 days. So for 40 days, you don't eat animal products. And so you end up with a bunch of leftover eggs. And so when Lent was over, people would boil these eggs with different flowers, and that would actually stain the boiled eggs different colors. So alternate theory of where the green eggs come from. (laughs) But I also find it funny. There is another Lent connection to another cryptid, which is if you skip Lent for Seven years, you become a Rougarou. Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> so now I know what that all is. And mm. and this this last year was our sixth unspent Lent. We got one more to go, boys. We got about 25 of those. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Uh, Been a Rougarou three times over right yeah. now. Another tradition associated with Lent is that the Saturday before the Sunday that Lent began... Children would travel in England. They would travel from door to door asking their neighbors for eggs. And they would give them as treats, basically. Everyone gets to eat all these eggs before Lent starts. Mm -hmm. For we're not able to eat eggs for 40 days, man. (laughs) No no omelets. So I think that's interesting as well. There's some egg collecting going on associated with Lent. And then you have different... Traditions with different churches dyeing eggs different colors. And so the egg also has come to symbolize 
I guess I kind of skipped over this, but the egg in part represents spring for the reason that the earth is bursting forth with new life. Mm -hmm. And so too does an egg. An egg explodes with new life and a little baby chicken comes out. Well, I guess it's not necessarily a chicken. It could be anything. Even a platypus. Platypus. Alligator eggs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The Easter alligator. So yeah, that's what it meant in more pagan days. It was a celebration, like a symbolism of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And But as it became mixed in with Christianity, it became a symbol of renewal, of man's renewal. Jesus dies and coming back to life. And the renewal of his life and our life as a result. So that's where that symbolism comes from. It kind of got mixed in, got ingratiated. And so you have different churches that went out and dominated different areas back in the day, mixing those pagan rituals where they would decorate eggs. So the Eastern Orthodox Church dyes their eggs red to symbolize the blood that was lost during the crucifixion. And then you have the Ukrainian art form called Pisanki, which stems back to pagan tradition i think this is interesting they don't paint their eggs they write on their eggs with beeswax hmm. mm. and they're foul eggs they're not uh, like the animal foul not bad eggs they're foul eggs and yeah and so that's still practice to this day that's what i got it's good see you see how the connections are interlocking pieces of a larger puzzle yeah it's a very very large puzzle I mean, you could even go one step further with uh, the conspiracy of the Virgin Mary holding a rabbit mm -hmm. with Jesus being the Easter bunny. <laughs> he died a man, came back something even greater, more powerful. A six foot tall yeah. rabbit that gives out eggs. <laughs> Just pooping them out. <laughs> yeah, we kind of went full circle there. Like an egg. Yes. I read a lot of that in my research as well. I didn't include a lot of it because I was... I told I told the uh, I told Eli this earlier when I was doing my research. I was like, "There's so much going on here. I'm limiting myself just to rabbits, just to the rabbits of Easter, the hares, and how it all relates." And we covered a lot in the last few minutes. But I have a couple extra fun facts that I would like to just stick in there that related to things we've already talked about. I'm but... afraid we're out of time. No! <laughs> and now I, on I, to the whoople tinger. I didn't want to interject while you were giving <laughs> all of your information, but just a couple extra tidbits here. Going back to the symbolism of the hare and the rabbit, we mentioned that it has a lot of roles throughout religious history and other cultures and things like that, so I just wanted to, like I said, give a couple more fun facts. So... Hares were given ritual burials alongside humans during the Neolithic Age in Europe, and archaeologists have interpreted this as a religious ritual, with hares representing rebirth. In the classical Greek tradition, hares were sacred to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and from the Greek world through the Renaissance, hares often appear as symbols of sexuality in literature and art. And then we already mentioned the rabbits being prolific procreators. And so because of that, they are an ancient symbol of fertility and new life, which kind of brings everything together again, being that Easter is a celebration of new life, both with the arrival of spring and the celebration of Jesus's resurrection. And then going back to the German Easter bunny, the Osterhaus, um, <laughs> there's one other legend that kind of is funny to me because... It throws a wrench in the whole tradition because it's uh, a story of misunderstanding, essentially. So it, it said that there was a poor woman in, living in Germany and she had decorated colorful eggs for her children to find in the garden just as a game to like keep them occupied and keep them happy. And so the eggs were hidden, she hid them, and then the children found them, of course. And as they found them, they saw a large hare hopping away and the children assumed that the hare had left the eggs and so that's where that idea comes from huh that's so sad <laughs> it's such a sad story because she put all this time and effort into it and the kids were like wow the magical fairy bunny left all these eggs for you know she's in the back with her hands like bleeding and yeah. from, like all night doing eggs and busted her back and stuff yeah that's rough mm -hmm. that's a story of motherhood yeah. you know well 
if we're talking about color flags, I, I would like to bring this up. I want to put this person on blast. So, have you ever seen, like, natural chicken eggs before? Like, they come out different colors. Kind of speckled and stuff, right? Speckled, brown, tan, sometimes even green. The white eggs you buy at the store are all, like, bleached, and Mm -hmm. that's why they're white. But anyways, there's, like, greenish eggs, eggshells, I should say. In elementary school, I told this girl that we had, sometimes our chickens laid green eggs. And she said, no, that's not possible. And I said, but it is, I've seen it. And she goes... No, my parents told me the elves come in at night and paint the eggs green. Mm. And I said, we're in fifth grade. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, putting that person on blast. You know who you are. (laughs) I doubt you listen to this podcast. (laughs) I've been called out. Also, also it turns out that the Eli I went to fifth grade with is also the podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, Talking about Easter and the Easter Bunny was not actually our original plan for this episode. Our original subject for today's episode was a different German bunny known as the Wolpertinger, which I think we're ready to move on to. Is that correct? I think so. We got all the Easter out of the way. Yeah, and since it was timely and it's a rabbit, I was like, we should talk about the Easter Bunny too. So Mm. this original subject the wolpertinger was actually introduced to me by my friend stephanie back in december she learned about the wolpertinger last year when she and her husband were in munich for oktoberfest so i saw her in december and uh she knows about our podcast and so she was like hey have you ever heard of this creature and i was like no actually i haven't and she was like oh my gosh let me tell you about it and she told me about her time in Munich, and she showed me a picture of her stuffed Wolpertinger. And I was like, you know what? This is Let's do this one. Let's do this one. So now I think we're ready to talk about the German jackalope. Let's see, this, this might be the last time you get to call the shots, because we, you suggested the Wolpertinger and it changes up on us. Talk about the Easter Bunny. Well, what's, what's going to happen next time? Oh, hey guys, let's talk about woolly mammoths. Just kidding. Let's talk about pygmy mammoths. <laughs> In my defense, we all agreed there wasn't very much on the Wolpertinger. I'm to cheesing you. Extend ya. the episode and and listen, it's a good tie-in too because they're both German. Mm. So it it's all coming together. Yeah, I mean, we could have gone the other route and uh, set off a whole uh, conflict of dogmatic intention with saying, is Jesus Christ a cryptid? (laughs) Goodness gracious. (laughs) Yeah. But the Wolpertinger, also known as the Wolperdinger, Wipertinger, Wibadinga. That's my favorite. Wolpertinger. The Wibadinga. Wibadinga. (laughs) That sounds Australian. (laughs) <laughs> no. that, that was the germans telling the australians about it <laughs> Woibadinga. so yes the Woibadinga is an animal said to inhabit the alpine forests of bavaria mm-hmm. and baden-wartenburg mm-hmm. germany that is southern germany i too have been to bavaria no wait oh. please save your applause till the end just kidding. I was I was curious. What's Bavaria like? It's awesome. I did not want to go to Germany, but I <clears throat> went. Uh, there was a kind of like our school, our high school hosted these trips during the summer that if you could afford it, you would travel as a big group with everyone in high school who was also, it was like open to everybody. It was like a big field trip that was open to everybody two weeks in Europe. And so every year was a different trip to Europe. So the year I went was shortly after my graduation, and I went to Germany, and I was like, well, it's a chance to travel, but I wasn't super stoked about the Germany part, because I was like, what's in Germany? Turns out a lot. A lot of cool stuff. (laughs) A lot of chocolate. So I, too, went to Munich. Um, When we worked at the movie theater together, I used to wear uh, this kind of leather satchel and bring it into work. I got that in Munich. Hmm. And then there's also tons of castles out there. I forget. There was a German king who, or Bavarian king, who was obsessed with building castles. So he had like 20 going at the same time. And none of them were completed because they were like really, really big castles. And then mysteriously enough, 
he and some other guy, I forget who it was, another prominent Bavarian official who they think might have been lovers, mm. were both found drowned in a, a small like man-made lake behind one of the castles. And obviously they were both dead, so nobody knows what happened. But yeah, that's one of the cool mysteries. Maybe it was the Woibadinga, you know, <laughs> just stomping on their heads. Anyway, He's like, stop building castles in my neck of the woods. But yeah, the uh, Disney castle is actually modeled after one of his castles. Oh. Um, Neuschwanstein. Yeah, yeah. Which I visited. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. Pretty big. Yeah, so I got totally won over to Germany when I went. Well, I've, I I did a little bit of research on Munich and Germany itself because it actually, some of its history and the Oktoberfest thing will actually tie into the Wolpertinger itself. So I wanted to share a little bit about that. So Bavaria is the largest state of Germany. Did you want to say something? What does the Woibadinga look like? You want to, okay. See, Wait, no. You started talking about Germany, so I thought we were going location first. Okay, we're going location, location. See, you threw it all off by talking about a fake cryptid. Just blame me. The Easter Bunny, you know. <laughs> a fake cryptid. Is the Joker a cryptid? Is Harley Quinn a cryptid? We're not discussing that. We're past that. <laughs> we're moving along. But since we're already talking about Germany, let's just do it. I did say German jackalope at the beginning of this, so I think most listeners kind of have an idea about what it might look like. But it does have some specifics to it, which we can bring up later. But back to Germany. Bavaria. Largest state of Germany, comprising the entire southeastern portion of the country. It's got high plateaus, medium-sized mountains. On the eastern edge of Bavaria are the Bavarian and Bohemian forests. And in the north is the Franconian forest. The majority of Bavaria's inhabitants still live in small towns. There's only about one-fifth live in cities of 100,000 or more. And Munich, which we've mentioned already, is the capital, and it's the third largest city in Germany. And tourism is very important here, as well as folk arts and culture. So there are many popular festivals that occur throughout the year, the best known being, of course, Oktoberfest, which is where Stephanie was at when she learned about the Wolpertinger. And I don't know how much you guys know about Oktoberfest, but Oktoberfest actually began as a wedding celebration more than 200 years ago, when Bavaria's crown prince Ludwig married Princess Theresa of Saxony Hildburghausen on October 12, 1810. And the original Oktoberfest was held on October 17, 1810, in honor of the nuptials that had happened a few days earlier. Nuptials. Nuptials. Nowadays, the 16 day festival actually mostly takes place in September. Do either of you want to take a guess of why Oktoberfest moved from October to September? So they could celebrate Halloween as a rager more. <laughs> you know, that's a valid answer. It's a good hypothesis, but no. Uh, is it because it's warmer in September? Does You're... it have something to do with Jesus? No. <laughs> you were close, though, with the warmer. It does have to do with the weather. So Oktoberfest got moved up, back, to whatever proper terminology you want to use there it got moved from october to september because of the rain so there were years of enduring bavaria's rainy fall weather and eventually organizers were prompted to move the start date of oktoberfest to the end of september so it almost always ends on the first sunday of october so it spans over the end of september beginning of october but these days, people go to Munich for Oktoberfest to consume liters of beer, indulge in German delicacies like bratwurst, sausages, and giant pretzels, which I was reminded of when we worked at the theater and we had the giant pretzel called the Bavarian Legend. So. <laughs> if you remember, our manager called it the Bavarian Beast. Really? <laughs> I don't remember you that. Don't remember that? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Somebody said... <laughs> She kept calling it the Bavarian Beast, and somebody was like, I think it's called the Bavarian Legend, and she goes, well, when I worked here, it was the Bavarian Beast. And it's like, okay. I mean, the alliteration does does make more sense. It than sounds so much more Bavarian intense. Legend. But, um, you know who ordered that? Oh, God. What's his name? Hold on, I gotta Google real quick, because I do not want to misspeak. Um, was it Pedro? 
No, no, no. <laughs> it was Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith oh, came in and ordered yeah. a Bavarian legend for me one time. Yeah, I have a very good memory of meeting Kevin Smith. Oh, I always forget about this. I was at Marketplace. The concession stand, the concession as, stand. as customers will know it as. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I guess that needs context for the podcast listeners, because our theater was not a normal theater. So, basically, you had the concession stand with the popcorn. You grabbed the stuff, then turned around and walked to the cashier. And so, that whole little area was called Marketplace. And so, basically, when you're as a cashier, you're seeing everybody walk in from behind you, walk up to the popcorn place, then turn around and come up to you. And so, and it was just after Kevin Smith had lost all that weight. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't aware of that. So, in comes this guy, backwards hat, wearing the jersey, it says Smith on the back. And I'm like, Kevin Smith? (laughs) And he turns around, and he looks right at me, shakes my hand, and goes... Good to meet you, man. And I was like, good to meet you. And then he's like, where's the bar? <laughs> You're like, upstairs. Upstairs. Well, Kevin Smith was on the right track looking for the alcohol because back to Oktoberfest now, <laughs> it's the largest folk festival in the world. And it also has the largest beer festival. It is the largest beer festival. Can you guess how many liters of ale are consumed each year at Oktoberfest? million two million try six million oh wow. damn we lowballed it six million liters of ale each year that's six million liters of yeah. piss oh my going God. into the city <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do they got for plumbing i don't know but um oktoberfest out in munich is held on the same field each year but there are there are plenty of oktoberfest festivals other places as well, including communities across the world that are not in Germany, such as here in the U.S. And uh, just just to always bring it back to Ohio, Cincinnati and Columbus are mentioned as two of the top ten other Oktoberfest celebrations, according to National Geographic. So if you can't go to Munich, you should go to Ohio for Oktoberfest. Any place in California? I didn't take note. Sorry. <laughs> Wow. I can I can look real quick if you want me to. I can go back to the list. Well, I have more to say about Bavaria. Do and it. Disney. Mm-hmm. So the town in Pinocchio is actually modeled after a town in Bavaria called Rothenburg. Mm. And Rothenburg is this very picturesque town. It's often called the Christmas card town because it, it's actually on a lot of Christmas cards. And they have my parent, my mom actually got a bunch of Christmas ornaments at this shop there. And we went in the middle of summer. Yeah, like, yeah. We capitalize on that. And we also got these traditional German treats. I don't want to call them a pastry, but they're called schneeballs. Mm-hmm. They're these giant balls made of uh, basically marzipan mm. and like covered in chocolate. They have different coatings i got just a basic chocolate one and uh boy it's a lot of sugar oh. like i was getting you take a couple bites and you're like dang i'm done <laughs> <laughs> this is it but they're good those schneeballs are good schneeballs yeah but rothenberg where it's at so this national geographic article is from 2014 so it's perhaps a little bit outdated but it is interesting to note that Ohio is the only U.S. state listed on the top 10 other Oktoberfests. So there's no California on the list. But they do have uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Leavenworth. Oh, I lied. Washington's on here. Leavenworth, Washington. There's a Venezuela one. Brazil, India, China, and Dubai. And Brisbane, Australia. Dubai. South Africa. Turning yeah. up out there. Washington. And Ohio are the places to go for Oktoberfest in the U.S. Okay, now I'm going to ask an obvious question. What does Oktoberfest have to do with the Waibadinga? Because the Waibadinga likes beer. Let's get into it. What is? Let's go back to the physical description of the Wolpertinger. Do you know what the Wolpertinger looks like, Alex? Yeah, from what I've been able to gather, it's basically if you take a bunny, give it some antlers on its head, Give it a nice set of wings on its back. And then just to shake up what we consider natural in nature, you give it giant fangs mm-hmm. so it can suck the blood of its enemies. Mm-hmm. And a long tail sometimes, or sometimes the legs of a pheasant, or webbed feet like a duck, or sometimes the head like a fox. 
<laughs> but yeah, there's a lot going on there. Typically, it is the a, a bunny, but sometimes it's also the body of a squirrel. But most commonly, it's a rabbit hybrid creature. A little, a little uh, German chimera. Yes, mm-hmm. allegedly the offspring of a romantic relationship between a hare and a roebuck. Mm-hmm. Which, what is a roebuck, you might ask? It is oh, a it's... male roe deer. Okay, yeah, I was like, I was a deer or something. But for a moment, I thought you were going to say it's a, the loving relationship between a hare and a robot. <laughs> and a robot. Yeah. Yes. I was like, oh, this just got real interesting. That is the Robodinga. <laughs> the Robodinga? Now, it just got farther and farther away from the Where name. the name Wolpertinger comes from is sort of unclear. There's not like a substan- uh, substantial claim. Is that what I want to say? There's no concrete evidence that this is true, but it's one theory is that it's a deviation from the name of a German town, Walter Dingen. Wal- Walter Dingen? Walter Dingen is probably more accurate. <laughs> Walter Dingen. Walter, Walter Dingen. Dingen. Which is famous for making shot glasses in the form of various animals and calling them Walter Dingers. So, Walter Dinger, Walter Dinger, Walter Danga, but the fun. Interesting. The alcohol connection. Is there more on that? There is. Not specifically related to the name, but specifically related to the behavior of the cryptid itself. Which includes the following. So, <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. But it is said to feed on other small animals, insects, roots, herbs. It's a very timid creature, believed to only come out during a full moon, and very difficult to catch. Bavarians view these creatures as being mischievous and not dangerous or life-threatening. But I saw your phone screen a second ago, and I, I know the article that you had pulled up on there. Yes. And... Did you read the very interesting things that it had to say about the way the Wolpertinger defends itself and what it does if it feels threatened? You know, I don't think I got down there. You got to tell me. Okay, so like I said, Bavarians view these creatures as being mischievous and not dangerous or life-threatening. There is a certain article online that I think is a mix of true... I use that term lightly, true like legend and myth, but also I think they took a lot of creative liberties because of the wording in this article. It like says a bunch of stuff and then it goes, did we get you there? And it's just like, I don't really know if you're messing around or whatever, but the claims they make in this article is that if the saliva of a Wolpertinger touches your skin, Mm. thick tufts of hair will begin to sprout. Which my question is, if it's spewing saliva at you, like spitting at you, and you have your mouth open, and it hits the back of your throat. Oh, God. You got a hairy throat, dude? That sounds horrible. It does sound horrible. It's a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's also, apparently, has it has the ability to spray a foul-smelling liquid onto its attacker, much like a skunk. Yeah. That cannot be removed until it magically disappears seven years later. Yes. You say that like you knew that, like it's fact. I don't yeah, I knew where it. does this come from though? It comes from medieval uh Germany where if you got sprayed by a skunk you'd stink for seven years because they didn't have the bath invented back mm-hmm. then. Yeah. It says you can't wash it off. It comes from that website, Jasmine. I know. That's why they said did we get you there? Because that, that usually implies that, that they're, they're lying. Messing. So it makes me wonder, like, how much of what they wrote in the article is actually, like, Imagine tied to the legend. all articles just had that. <laughs> did we get you there? Well, get the you? exact quote from the article says, okay, we'll stop. But did we have you there for a second? And it's just like, what are you doing? You're talking down to your audience, which is not a good way to get them to like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah. Like you should be doing the Crypty Campfire. Hey! <laughs> But back to the beer now. This is this is where it comes in. So you can apparently only see a Wolpertinger mm. if you are drunk. Oh, that's not what I got. What did you get? I got... <laughs> the only way that you can see a Wolpertinger is... Mm. I know where you're going with On this. a full moon. I know where you're going with this. Well, you, why are you surprised? Anyways, if you enter the Bavarian forest in the company of an attractive single woman... During a full moon, is then the Wolpertinger will make itself known. Yeah, but only after the woman does something very specific. 
What? Yeah. I didn't know. You I didn't, didn't re- know that. Oh, oh wait, what is oh, it? Man. What is it? Okay. Well, before okay. Uh, apparently, the best way to catch a Wolpertinger is to enter the forest on a full moon with an attractive woman who will then expose her chest. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> to cause the creature to be transfixed, allowing it to be easily caught. <laughs> that, that's how you get most cryptids, actually. I know. And then you gotta sprinkle its tail with salt, right? Okay, wait. Before we get to that, because I have a question about that. Huh? Alternatively, going back to the woman thing, it can be used as a pickup line. So, like, I read that sometimes a guy can be like, hey, you wanna go out to the forest? If the Wolpertinger shows itself, then that means we must be good for each other. Like, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Because the Wolpertinger will only show itself if a woman enters the forest with, quote, the right man. Mm-hmm. Um, but back to the putting salt on the tail thing. I was so confused. So, Eli, you're currently working on a documentary about Ogopogo. And in that documentary, you talk about a song called Ogopogo, the Funny Foxtrot. Yes. And there's a line in that song that talks about putting salt on the tail. And I was like, whoa, what does that mean? What is that connection? Turns out there's actually a saying about salting a bird's tail, which is a legendary superstition. It's from Europe and America. It's the superstition that sprinkling salt on a bird's tail would render the bird temporarily unable to fly, which means you can capture it. So that makes sense for like these connections, I guess. But then I'm also like, if you can get close enough to sprinkle a bird's tail with salt, then you can probably get close enough to just catch it without having to do that. <laughs> no, that's my favorite part of the song, actually. The Ogopogo, the funny foxtrot. The guy says, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of salt on his tail. I'm looking for the Ogopogo while I'm playing on my old banjo. Mm-hmm. While he's playing on his old banjo. The, o- the Ogopogo plays a banjo, apparently. According to the song. According to the lore. Until you hear the... It's not just the Jaws music, it's banjo music before mm-hmm. the Ogopogo Dude, shows up. how crazy would that be? Holy beep, smoke. Beep, 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 beep. Deliverance all over again. <laughs> but with a giant snake monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in addition to only being able to see these creatures when you're drunk, apparently, the Wolpertinger is also attracted to the scent of the beer festivals. So... It makes a lot of sense that the Wolpertinger would be sort of advertised at Oktoberfest with all of these alcoholic tie-ins. Well, that further connects it to its American cousin, the Jackalope. Oh? Yeah. I can't remember if you were there for that episode. Do you remember, Alex? Like how to how to catch? A Jackalope. A Jackalope, yeah. yeah. You gotta leave out a little bit of old American made whiskey for them. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah, you do. And they'll drink the whole cask. Yeah. And get will. so drunk they'll pass out and that's how you could that's how you can get a, really? a jackalope. jackalope. Yeah. <laughs> and the the other thing I remember from the episode is so jackalopes only mate during thunderstorms. <laughs> Wait, I don't remember this. <laughs> but they say that jackalopes are so fast at mating that it's when the lightning strikes is when they're doing the deed, and then they're done. (laughs) They're as fast as lightning. Hey, that goes back, I mean, that goes back to the fertility thing, the procreation thing we were talking about earlier. Wow, think about it. Every time lightning strikes, jackalope babies are being made. (laughs) (laughs) And if they're hermaphrodite, they're doing it to themselves. (laughs) Just popping them out. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Apparently, some ancient engravings and woodcuts of Wolpertingers can be found, with some dating back to the 17th century. However, reported sightings of Wolpertingers are very hard to come by. But the legend has crossed over the border into Austria, where it's known as a word that I have a really hard time pronouncing. Rawaka. Yeah, something like that. Rawakal. Rawakal. Rarical, something like that. Man. And it also resembles other creatures from other German folklore, too. Like what? The Rasselbach of the Thuringian Forest. And the Elverdrich. Elverdrich of the Palatin- Palatinate region, which is a chicken like animal with antlers. And then there's the Dildap of the Alemannic region. <laughs> and then the Swedish Skavadra. Well, how about the one that makes your vorpal blade go snicker snack? Huh? 
and with its head you go galumphing back. What's that? The Jabberwocky. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that when I was looking at all the the German words for these cryptids. I'm just like, yeah, where do you find the vocal blade, though? <laughs> hey, like, you know what I discovered, though? So, I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier, but I always have trouble trying to figure out how to pronounce things from other languages, and... Google Translate's the answer, man. You just copy and paste that word into Google Translate and select the language, and then there's a little button that you can hear them pronounce it. So my favorite one was the last one that I just said, the Skavadra. That's fun to say. That's a good one. Skavadra. And it's like a funny monster, too? Yeah, it's similar. If you look that up, you'll just get Wolpertinger results. So they're kind of just believed to be the same thing. Well, now, anyways, in case you haven't picked up on it, the Wibbeding is not real? Mm, I mean, that's a really strong statement to make. Well, it's got something in common with its American cousin, is that it was invented by taxidermists. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's not real, dude. Do tell. <laughs> you, you mean to we tell don't... me that this is not a bona fide Wolfetinger? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, this one's my favorite, though. I love this little guy so much. They are cute. As much as taxidermy can freak me out sometimes, they can be cool. Especially if they're at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> mm. Yes, so Wolpertingers stretch back to the 1800s when Bavarian taxidermists began to get crazy with their inventions. Mm -hmm. And they sold these to unwitting tourists who believed them to be examples of Bavarian wildlife. Mm -hmm. It's like the Fiji mermaid. Mm hmm just like the uh, jackalope. You know, I saw <laughs> I saw a jackalope taxidermy. Taxiderm? What's the what's the uh, What's the singular noun for a taxidermy stuffed thing? Is it taxiderm? Hold on, let's figure this out. Yeah, it's um or maybe it's just an adjective, a taxidermied animal. Either way, they had one at the Longhorn restaurant in my hometown. And as a kid, I didn't know that those weren't real. I'm like, it's sitting right there. It's it's real. It's a jackalope. It's a bunny with horns. So taxidermy will get you. Because the, the some of the famous taxidermies in the world are jackalopes, wolpertingers. Uh, have you heard of the fur-covered trout? No. Yeah, no. I have, yes. It was uh, said to be from Alaska only, where it was so cold, even the fish grew fur to keep themselves warm. Do tell. Keep going. And so trappers would catch fish, taxidermy them, and then add a layer of fur onto it and try to sell it to tourists and people. Of like, hey, look at this. You can, you know, a bona fide fur-covered yeah. trout straight from Alaska. I see. I see. Interesting. Yeah, but it wasn't real. <laughs> no. Nope. But sometimes rabbits can appear to grow antlers. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of papillomavirus? Probably, I probably talked about it in the jackalope episode. Yeah. It's close to basically what The Last of Us is. Oh, is it? Where instead of it, because it's more of a bone structure, but yeah. it's like some kind of like, is it start off as like like a fungal infection? I don't know. I, it, I read that it was a virus. Oh, okay. So Maybe it's a, a virus. Yeah. It's, but just the, the idea of like things, weird things growing out of animals' heads. Yeah. it get, It's this bony antler-like tumor that grows out of the rabbit's head and body, giving it an unnerving appearance. It's a tumor. <laughs> it's a, not a tumor. <laughs> Ooh, I forgot to put the word rabbit in my Google search, and I got lots of yucky photos. Uh, oh, does it pass to people? Yeah. Ew. The Wolpertinger has transcended its taxidermical state and has shown up in massive multiplayer online games such as RuneScape and World of Warcraft. Oh, has it? Yeah, you that's... can hunt oh, Wolpertingers in those games. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Guys, papillomavirus is an STD. <laughs> For any of those who didn't know, oh, it's human, an S human papillomavirus is the most common sexually transmitted infection. STI, sorry, not STD, STI. Yeah. And it makes you grow horns out of your head? No, it's 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 in other places, 
but it's warts. You grow horns? Dude, yeah. Horny. <laughs> <laughs> Takes it to a whole new level. No, 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 no. We're getting okay. down to brass tacks Good and a Lord. lot of sayings in this episode. I'm so sorry if I said that word and anyone was triggered. I did not realize that there was a human version of it because I only looked up the rabbit. And then just now on right. air, I, I re-looked it up and I just typed in the word without the word rabbit accompanying it. And I got some medical picture, pictures, some medical illustrations. And yeah, whew, learned something new today. All right, moving on. Well, I got back qu- to the pop culture. Well, that was all I have. Oh, OK. RuneScape, RuneScape, <laughs> RuneScape, World of Warcraft, War of Worldcraft. The Brothers Grimm mentioned it in their book, which, okay, their book, The German Legends of the Brothers Grimm, which is interesting because Jacob Grimm, half of the Brothers Grimm, there's some overlap with the Easter Bunny, believe it or not, because Jacob Grimm argued that the Easter hare was connected to a goddess he imagined would have been called Ostara in ancient German, who actually is is just the same goddess we talked about early, Eoster. So... I thought that was interesting that we're doing this this combined episode of the Easter Bunny and the Wolpertinger because they're both German and the Brothers Grimm are involved in both somehow. Well, how about this? this t- trivia. Where does the Easter Bunny live? Germany. Easter Island. Thank you. You got it correct, Dang. Alex. Easter Island. It's in uh, the movie Hop. I haven't seen that movie. I haven't either. Oh, I saw I just <laughs> It's part of the lore. They, they like... They live underneath Easter Island in this giant facility where they make the eggs and all the bunnies and the chicks work together to make Easter happen every year. So Easter Bunny, can, I think he actually has like an egg sleigh he uses too. Oh my lord. Yeah, man. Well, the last thing I'll mention about sort of like pop culture-esque things about the Wolpertinger is you can get the stuffed versions like the plush and the taxidermy because they have them... They're like tourist things. They're, they're like any other cryptid commodity when you go somewhere. You can get stuffed ones. You see pictures of it at the local pubs and hotels and restaurants and things like that. But there's actually a Wolpertinger exhibit at the German Hunting and Fishing Museum. So there's a permanent exhibition there. Yeah? You can go see. Yeah. That's cool. What's in it? I'm assuming just a stuffed Wolpertinger, a taxidermy. Wolpertingers and some of the best damn chocolate you've probably ever had. <laughs> I know. Ooh, why not? Since I'm I'm in the midst of it, putting people on blast, speaking of German chocolate, I was at Ikea with my parents, and we got into a discussion with an Ikea worker about German chocolate. And the lady, for some reason, believed that the only way to get German chocolate was to import German cows to the United oh States. Which, that just confused everybody. Because she kept saying, well, how do they bring over the cows? It's like, that's not how German chocolate's made. She, she's like, the, you know, you get white milk from white cows, you get chocolate milk from the, the brown <laughs> the cows. Brown, the brown cows. You know? And then the pink cows make strawberry milk. <laughs> like... Pink cows would be so cute, though. Let's be real. Ah. I searched my whole life for one of those. But uh, I do want to say, the Wuppeltinger, he may not be real. Maybe more of a cultural icon, maybe a, a little myth. But from his love of beer, his love of pretty women exposing their chests in the forest, <laughs> we can all decide he's just one of the guys. <laughs> I mean, that's what he sounds like. <laughs> he's just one of the boys hanging out. This episode yeah. was a little off the rails, but in a good way, I think. It was a little extreme. <laughs> extreme. Dude, we t- Egg stream. Yeah. yeah, so we we broke down the barriers on what it means to breed like a rabbit. We found mm-hmm. out where green eggs and ham came from. Mm-hmm. We found out where the term horny stems from. Oh, God. I'm, <laughs> I'm, again, so, so I'm a little bit embarrassed about that, too. Like, that, that's, I wasn't in that mindset, you know? I'm reading about rabbits with horns, and I wasn't wasn't registering that there is a human counterpart to that virus that is not so great but anyway happy easter everyone yeah, happy easter make sure you eat those eggs or they go bad you know depending on when this episode comes out in previous years it could drop actually very close to easter because easter is always on a different day 
for those who don't know, it's like, what is it? After Today. the first Sunday, after the full moon, after the spring equinox. So, anywhere from the end of March to mid-April is where Easter falls most of the time. So, it's still relevant, as long as this episode comes out in April. <laughs> I hope it will. Hopefully. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for enduring the shenanigans of today's episode. I hope it was entertaining. Yeah, I, if anything, I hope you got a lot of good info. Some good conversation starters at yeah, your next party. Yeah, that's true. Conversation starter. Yeah. Can't wait to have this episode loaded up on my iPod. Mm, yes. And he's not joking. He will do it. How many episodes do you have again? I have all episodes. I think all 226 up to this point. 227 coming in hot, baby. Goodness yeah. gracious. Oh, yeah. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. And don't forget to get your tickets to Monster Fest 2. We're all going to be there. We're all going to be doing a live version of this podcast. We have some ideas for what we'll be talking about that day. But... Boy, Bedinga Part 2. No, <laughs> yeah. no, we'll no. just rehash everything we did, but it'll be live. Yeah, Monster Fest 2, hosted by Small Town Monsters, is going to be taking place in Canton, Ohio at the end of June. There will be a movie premiere for Eli's new film, Cursed Waters. What's the what's the second part of the title? I can never remember the, the, the word new choice. Empire. I think it's the, the new, I think it's the the creature of Lake Okanagan. The creature of Lake Okanagan. Yeah. So come out, see the movie, come to the the convention, visit the vendors, meet all the people, listen to the podcasts, take the what are what are they calling them? The not seminars, not classes. Devon there's demonstrations. Like it's it's like interactive. Talks? Something like that. But yeah, come see all the speakers. It'll be really fun. We had always talked about the possibility of something like this happening for us in the future, and it is. We're gonna be we're gonna be at an event. It's gonna be really fun. So get your tickets. We'll see you there. <laughs>